Kate. Um, even though Kate already acknowledged our board's debt to Ron Crawl for inviting Dr. Kaplan here, I just wanted to add a personal note. I interrupted Ron's busy schedule at the bookstore yesterday to try to get some more information beyond that which you can typically get by Googling such a distinguished person as Dr. Kaplan, and he was more than willing to tell me a few things that will not be necessarily in the biography that you have in your program, because I'm certainly not going to repeat that. The one thing I would note about the program, below Steamboat, our seminars in Steamboat is our sort of subhead dialogues in public policy. And this is what we try to do in a nonpartisan way. And let me just try to give you an idea of some of the breadth of our guests' experience and contributions in the areas of public policy that he has chosen to work with. Just taking human experimentation for a minute, probably the worst example of human experimentation in the history of our country's health services was the so-called Tuskegee study. It was Dr. Kaplan who extracted the first official policy from the United States government uh, on that uh, infamous episode. It was a little late, it was 30 or 40 years after this episode. That you can Google, because I don't really like to talk about it. On the other hand, taking a more wonderful recent medical technology breakthrough, that of bone marrow transplants, uh, Dr. Kaplan led the committee to decide how to deal with the always difficult task of a bone marrow transplant registry. And certainly patients who have benefited from that uh, have reason to be grateful. Now, anybody who's ever worked in a university setting has been on many, many committees, and I know our guest has been on many. He tends to chair them and they tend to be extremely important committees. Now anybody can get on a committee in a medical center, usually just by saying something that offends the dean of your department. Uh, it's a kind of a traditional punishment. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what you have to do to be chair of so many uh, committees. It's sort of a, the capital punishment of committeedom. But again, to expand what's in the bio in your uh, in your uh, booklet here, let me give you an example of a couple of those that aren't in there. He chaired the President's Committee on Gulf War Illnesses and the implications there ethically. He chaired the Health and Human Services Committee on Blood Products and their availability. Now, someone who's this busy and has this many tasks I've always wondered how they deal with media, whether they have a separate media phone or a separate media person uh, that fields these things. And I asked him, uh, gee, I bet you've had a few requests, even though you're sort of uh, in a rural area here on vacation, having to do with Ebola. And he said, yeah, my family's kind of annoyed since the beginning of the week have, I forget, 60, 70, maybe 80 requests from the media for comment. But again, to give you an idea of how, uh, how great is the breadth of his contribution in this area of our health system, just some examples of his media importance. He does a regular show on NBC.com. He's a regular uh, contributor to MedMD, or WebMD and Medscape. He was named USA Today's Person of the Year. In the last year alone, he's had five or six pieces in Time Magazine, and a couple of the top 10 most influential things that he's been named to are in your booklet, but he's had numerous uh, such experiences. So finally, I'm sure you all know when you get a D after your name, whether it's a PhD or a JD or an MD, it means doctor. What I always like to emphasize is doctor means teacher and carries with it some responsibility to teach. And it's pretty obvious that our guest tonight has been committed to teaching in his chosen area for his whole career. And I can recall being a young, uh, and very inexperienced head of a, of a new ethics program 
and having students come up to me with an ethics question or having a faculty member come up to me with an ethics question that they didn't have an answer to. And often I had no answer to it as well, and I would simply say something like, whoa, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> and but that usually you can't stop there if you're supposed to have some, some dignity and leadership. But it was always safe to say, you go to the library, there are over 30 books written or edited by this fellow Arthur Kaplan. Or you can go to the internet, and there are over 600 articles in peer-reviewed journals. I'm sure you can find something that will help you. And that, if it was a cop-out, generally worked, generally made me a student again, and I'm looking forward to sitting down and for the next 45 minutes or so being a student of his again. Well, that was great. I'm glad it's being taped. <laughs> I'm going to send that to my mother right away. Um, she's less interested in my opinions than apparently uh, Dr. Merrill was or Dr. Uh, Crow. Uh, she keeps wondering why anybody listens to me. Uh, my father's even more skeptical. So it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. Um, I uh, know that one way to really soften up an audience is to praise them. So I was just in Aspen at the Ideas Festival, and recently I was just in Martha's Vineyard, which runs a version of this. But it's prettier here, and the audience is smarter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. So, uh, Rationing is a big topic, and there are a lot of ways to go at it, but it turns out that while nothing much good has come from Ebola, one thing that has come from it is a lot of discussion of rationing. And since you all have been probably aware of this epidemic and people trying to respond to it, I'm going to start by giving you some information about that, some different rationing issues that have come up regarding uh, Ebola, and then I'm going to switch over to health reform and depress you for a while. So health reform actually turns out to be more depressing than Ebola, which is really, <laughs> but that's going far, but that's how it is. Um, Ebola, for those of you who uh, live in isolation or quarantine, is a disease that has broken out in West Africa. We've had outbreaks before. Ebola was first discovered as a uh, virus that attacked people uh, with lethal consequences frequently uh, by the Ebola River in the Democratic Republic of Congo back in 1976-ish. That was the first known outbreak of Ebola. It spread in the Congo, spread uh, in nearby Sudan. And I think at that time about 100 people died. And what happens with these epidemics is the disease is so nasty that it kills people before they can infect others. So it's not easily transmissible, partly because it's very fatal. Um, the other uh, bit of news about Ebola is it's a tiny little uh, viral particle. Uh, for those of you in the audience who care about these things, it's a little RNA molecule. So it sort of captures the DNA of normal cells, inserts itself, and starts basically destroying cells. In this case, it goes after every cell and every organ, some viruses. As you know, if you get the flu or some other things that might go after your lungs or certain things could attack the heart, depending on the kind of virus it is. This thing attacks everything. That's why it's so nasty. You have a virus that uh, probably causes, at this point in time, 90% of the people who get it die. So it's a very, very highly lethal virus. And we've had three or four major outbreaks since then. This one going on now is the biggest one that has ever happened. How contagious is it? It is not communicable by coughing or sneezing. It's not an airborne uh, disease. It needs a little organic environment. Basically, it's blood contact. So if you touch somebody who's bleeding, and people with this disease sadly do bleed, and they get blood on them, the virus can live in there. 
Funeral customs in that part of Africa often involve touching the body, uh, putting the shroud around the body. That leads to infectivity. You could get it if blood was splattered on you. That's why we talk all the time about uh, putting on a gown, putting on goggles, putting on a shield. And those methods are pretty good. They're really pretty fail safe. If you have that equipment around, you're in pretty good shape to protect uh, against getting the disease. Could you get it by somebody leaving dried blood behind? It's not clear. The virus probably doesn't live more than 12 hours, but maybe that's a way if you came in contact that way. Other than that, I will say with fair amount of authority, Ebola is not coming to Steamboat Springs. It's, it's, it's not a disease that's going to spread like HIV or the flu or other diseases like that. However, if you don't have masks and goggles and quarantine, it's a disease that spreads and that's what's going on. I think it's now in five countries in Western Africa. So it's in the Ivory Coast, it's in Guinea, it's in Liberia, it's in Nigeria, uh, it's in one other one that I can't remember. Sierra Leone. So, well, why don't you give the talk? <laughs> so, uh, this isn't Jeopardy, you know. So, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's spread further than uh, most of these epidemics have, and it's taken a toll. Probably about 1,700 people have died, and uh, there are probably maybe 2,600 2, cases identified. There could be more, because the most common area where this thing is moving is in rural Africa. Um, that tends to be with those funeral customs and practices uh, where people don't have any protective things and they try to care for somebody and they get infected. So that's sort of the backdrop of the disease and where does the rationing and the public policy questions come in? Well, one set of questions is, how did this disease get going and spread so much? And the honest answer to that is, the world let it happen. You have this outbreak in rural parts of Western Africa, and there was a very slow response. Doctors Without Borders was there, and they called for help, and they said, we need more isolation, quarantine, we need more gloves, and nobody went. So the disease moved faster because it was in the rural areas, not urban, harder to get to, very few people on the ground to go and help or who knew what to do. There was denial by some of the local governments. No one wants to admit that there's Ebola in your country. You just cover that up, by the way. That's true with diseases like cholera, which are embarrassing, stigmatized, humiliating. Those numbers are always underreported at any given time about where the disease is. Ebola is just like that. If you want to end tourism, put out a sign that says we've got Ebola. <laughs> so they're not always quick to admit there's a problem. And we have a problem right now. We think, or some Americans think, that it's good to kind of you know, build walls across the Mexican border or make sure we know who's coming in here and so forth, almost a kind of isolation uh, attitude. But if you want to control epidemics, you've got to have a public health system and approach, both the US and other rich countries that reaches out. Because the best thing you can do is stop it before it gets anywhere else. And this is a, a disease that you really could control if you got there early, quarantine everybody, saw the first people, sadly, who were infected die, but then made sure nobody touched the bodies, that you had better uh, funeral practices, that you came with your moon suit and your gloves and your goggles and your face shields none of which exist in the countries we're talking about. So the first major problem is that we need to think about how are we going to respond, whether it's pandemic flu or an outbreak of Ebola or any other highly communicable disease, are we going to sort of say we're in our country and, you know, sorry that bad things happen over there. We can, but we do live in a world of air travel and boats and railways and people move around and I don't think you're going to be able to protect yourself just by saying I don't care what goes on over there. Furthermore, if we do care what goes on over there ethically, we want to stop deaths there, then you've got to get a faster response. So one take home lesson from Ebola, which the media isn't talking about too much, 
but it's very important is why was the response so slow? If we can't get to places where outbreaks are gonna be likely to happen, which is rural and remote for many of these things, then we have to upgrade the rapid deployment capability of WHO or CDC or other organizations like that to get there. Second interesting rationing question about Ebola. Some of you know that two people came home from Africa. You've seen this in the news, right? The two folks that went to Atlanta wound up at Emory University Hospital and they both got infected with Ebola when they were trying to treat people in Liberia. This led one of our great public health officials, Donald Trump, to ask, <laughs> why are these people here? <clears throat> I've been asking that about Donald Trump for a long time. <laughs> but, <clears throat> you know, I saw something funny about Donald Trump. This has nothing to do with Ebola, it's just funny. He, he said something in the news yesterday, I don't know if you saw this, he said he wanted his name taken off the uh, Trump Casino in Atlantic City because it was embarrassing to him. And I thought, that's pretty optimistic, embarrassing Donald Trump. <laughs> that's a little levity in the middle of a plane. So uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, so we have these two people, and they come back, and they're brought back. Rationing question comes up. One of the key officials in Sierra Leone asked a question after these two people came back and he said, why are two Americans being helped and nothing was done to help us in Sierra Leone in terms of giving them medicines? Because these two who came back got an experimental medicine. And the suggestion was that you're not giving us the medicine because we're poor and black and far away and you're just taking care of your own people, and that's not right. So it was a rationing challenge and an equity challenge. Why didn't you give us the medicine? Why are you helping those people? So that's a good way to get into the discussion of rationing. So how do we make decisions? And by the way, I don't mean to offend anybody's political sensibilities here, but when you hear politicians say that we don't ration Healthcare? That should be an ex-politician. Because that's the stupidest thing that you can say about healthcare. Healthcare gets rationed all the time. If one of the doctors at Yampa gets a lot of phone calls all at once, he's gotta, or she's gotta make a decision about how much time to spend with somebody. There's not an infinite amount of time. People are constantly making rationing decisions. You get a call in the middle of the night, you're gonna bring them in, you're gonna go see them, you're gonna say, see me in the morning. You're a primary care person, you get a lot of people coming, which ones do you wanna see first? People get triaged at the hospital. Rationing is a day-to-day -day occurrence. I'm sorry to tell Sarah Palin, but rationing goes on. It goes on clearly in areas where we don't have enough medicine to treat everybody. And so I'm gonna talk about it here, not because it's unusual, it's just stark but it happens all over the system. You've gotta make choices all the time about what to do. So how did the two people get the medicine? <laughs> Not so smart now. Huh? So, you're gonna be sorry you answered that question. So uh, we have these, uh... <laughs> oh, it wasn't you, okay, all right. <laughs> so we have these two people. One was a doctor deployed uh, over in Liberia. Another was running the hospital basically there. They got exposed to trying to care for infected people. And that is, they uh, uh, somehow or another didn't have the equipment. I don't know what the route of transmission was, but they got infected and Doctors and nurses and orderlies and other healthcare people are at the greatest risk of exposure because they're right there dealing with patients with the blood exposure. So that's your high risk group, the highest of all. Wouldn't really be sitting next to somebody even on an airplane. It's really somebody who's coming into blood contact and doesn't have the right equipment to deal with it. So that's how they got infected. You may not know, but 
The medicine that was tried on them is highly experimental. It has only been given to about, uh, well, certainly less than 10 monkeys. Monkeys were infected with Ebola. A, the medicine works in this case by trying to, remember I told you the virus comes in and it takes over the genes uh, of your body? Well, what this thing does is it tries to fool that little DNA virus into not being able to take over the cells of your body. So it is basically a kind of a uh, immune buster. It will go look to see whether there is some signal from the virus that can lead your immune system to attack it. So it's for people who already are infected. It won't work particularly well, we don't think, to prevent infection, but it will target if it detects the, some part of the Ebola molecule, it will go after it. So they got the medicine. It's made by a little company in San Diego called MAP. The little company has nine employees. It's not exactly Ron's old Glaxo outfit. Um, <laughs> There's a good joke there, but I'm going to let that go. And um, so uh, you got a little teeny company. And why is there a little teeny company? Here's your next rationing question. Would Glaxo or Novartis or Pfizer be interested in finding a cure for Ebola? It's probably not high on the list. Ebola outbreaks are rare. They happen in very poor parts of the world where there's not a lot of money. And there are certainly other bigger public health problems, even for people in rural Africa, than Ebola. They're bad when they happen, but it would be kind of odd to have a big commitment uh, to find a vaccine to prevent Ebola or a drug to treat Ebola when it happens rarely. And there aren't that many people in places that could actually probably buy the drugs or buy the vaccines. So it isn't going to command the attention of the biggest uh, pharmaceutical companies, unless maybe the science was such that they said, oh, we've got something that we really think would work here, and you know, we could put it to use. But just to set out to try and invent the antidote or invent the vaccine, it's pretty low priority. So who would put money into this? Well, the outfit that puts money into it is your government, and in particular, Homeland Security, and in particular, the military. The military has funded this little company and a couple of others because they worry about bioterror. Even though Ebola wouldn't particularly be your weapon of choice, it could be pretty terrifying to introduce it here. And we might send soldiers or personnel overseas to places and they could be exposed. So you may need an antidote for that reason. So without military and homeland security funding, the little company wouldn't be there and we wouldn't have anything going on in the way of response to Ebola other than prevention with the goggles and the quarantine and the restrictions on travel. There are a couple of other uh, drugs. The media doesn't seem to be capturing this fact, but there are some others. One is a drug that prevents you from getting infected. That's still early trials, early days too. And there are a couple of companies working on vaccines, all with military contracts. So rationing. Do we want to say the government will put more money into rare diseases overseas? Do you want to say the government, your government, should spend more money on diseases here that we get? Malaria is out there, kills a lot of people. Tuberculosis is out there, kills a lot of people, but not as many here as are affected overseas. So another key rationing decision is what's your priority? The only reason that little experimental medicine existed was because of US national security. It wouldn't exist otherwise. So many factors influence how we prioritize what we're going to spend our money on in terms of a disease antidote or a disease preventative intervention. And one other thing influences this, which I have to say for those of you interested in this area, it's hard to do experiments on monkeys. There are animal rights issues and there are cost issues. And so when I said there were nine monkeys who were given Ebola, I can tell you that's a lot of controversy right there about whether you should try to kill a monkey with a deadly disease. So that's going to be a restriction on the models that you use to try and find a cure. There aren't so many primates in use. The number's been falling. There are moral arguments about the use of animals in research. And it's expensive to maintain these primates. So that slows down your research, too. And another way of looking at it is the fewer the monkeys, 
the more likely you're going to be the first person to test the drug. <laughs> to choice. Animal rights, they may sound good. If it's your kid who got infected with something, you say, has this been tested in animals? And you say, no, because that was immoral. Then you're the first subject. So again, complicated. Rationing choice about how fast you can go depends on where the uh, test subjects are going to be. All right, so to recap, not a high priority disease, very few people working on it, tiny companies with federal contracts sponsored by the military trying to do something about it. Could have had the epidemic, I believe, under control faster, but a very slow international response to getting there in these rural, poor, tiny countries. Um, which, you know, if the outbreak, I hate to say it, had taken place in a more populous place or someplace that was politically important, I suspect we would have seen a much quicker response. So we've got our two people, and they get infected. So how do they get the medicine? Do we have a panel of ethicists, or is it sometimes known <clears throat> a death panel? <laughs> it always bothered me. I thought that was a nice thing to do, have a panel to make decisions. Apparently not. Um, so did a panel sit around and say, people in Sierra Leone, people in Nigeria, people who just got infected, people who've been infected for a while, people who are very, very sick and almost dead, people who have other problems, parasites besides their Ebola, old people, young people? No. Now, you could set up something to do that. And you might even say, do we have any rules about this that you could consult if you wanted to give out this drug? And we don't have international rules, although a meeting has been called for next week at the WHO to try and discuss this. But there is no agreed upon set of rules about who to give this medicine to. Why are we talking about rationing with this medicine? Because the amount of medicine that exists in the world is about that much. That's how much there is. We'd probably maybe not even fill that bottle, but there ain't much. So you're in rationing because you have a scarce supply. You have many more people who want the uh, intervention than can have it. And the definition of rationing is you are going to try and give something to somebody that might save their life or prevent severe disability, but you don't have enough and you can't get any more. That makes for the classic rationing scenario. So no agreed upon rules about what to do. So why these two? The answer is the organization that supported them, the evangelical Christian organization that had sent this medical mission into Liberia, called up the CDC and said, is there anybody who's making anything for Ebola? And the CDC said, we, CDC said, we think so. There's a San Diego company that we think is working on this. They called up the company. The company said, we'll give you some of this. I don't know if they said, if you give us money. Or maybe they thought, if we give it to you, maybe it's good because we'll attract more funding and support. We'll get publicity. Or maybe they said, gee, I don't know if we should give it to them because if these two people die and they die on our drug, that'll set us back. I don't know. I don't know what that discussion was. But what I do know is those two people got the drug because the organization they work for asked. That's it. There's nothing else going on. There's no racism, no poverty, no discrimination. <laughs> Nobody else asked. Uh, it's a weird form of rationing, uh, giving it to the people who ask you. <laughs> uh, but that's what it was. So we don't have, think about this. You've all looked at the news and seen uh, little kids who need drugs. You see these appeals on the media, save Josh Hardy, remember the little kid in Tennessee who needed a drug and his family mounted a social media campaign to give him an unapproved drug. He was dying at St. Jude's Hospital. This was just a couple months ago. You all were looking at the news a couple months ago, right? You remember a couple months ago? <laughs> so anyway, we see these social media campaigns all the time. People are begging for access to unapproved drugs. A lot of people think the FDA is in the way. Your state, Louisiana, 
Arizona have passed right to try laws, right? You know these laws? They say you can take any drug you want without consulting the FDA. The FDA must be in the way. The FDA is not in the way. 99% of the time when the FDA is asked to approve a drug in a compassionate use situation where it hasn't been through the formal approval process, it says yes. There is a 1% that usually are saying to the guy who said, well, I made it in my bathtub and I gave it to the dog and the dog <laughs> seems okay. Um, they sometimes turn those down. But 99% of the time they say, go for it. And politicians, your governor, governor of Arizona, thinking about this, Nevada's contemplating a law right now. They love standing up and saying, of course we must help little Josh, little Susie, little Frederica, whoever it is, get this drug, even if it isn't approved, we must have it. But they don't wanna pay for it. And most of these drugs, like the company that's making this little anti-Ebola thing, it's gonna cost a lot of money. They only made that much. Their investors said, uh, the federal government, you know, we got to put it through the approval process. We're not going to make it a lot of it until we know that it works. Well, you're going to make a little bit, test it. If it works, we'll figure out a way to make a lot of it. And I haven't told you some of the details of how you make, well, I'll tell you now. You put some Ebola genes in rats, you let them make the antibodies. You take the antibodies, those things that attack the virus, out of the rats, mix them up, and get this, you put them in tobacco plants, viral infection, and they grow in there, and you extract them out of tobacco leaves. So keep smoking. <laughs> it's the road to health. Um, R.J. Reynolds is in an alliance with the San Diego company. No kidding. Not making that up. Well, maybe I am. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> it's real. It's true. It's actually true. They run the warehouse, the tobacco warehouse, that they infect, the leaves take, I don't know, Three months to grow, you extract the virus out of there, purify it and stick it back in. That's why there's only this much of the drug because that's a long, complicated manufacturing process and there is no way that an antidote to Ebola is not gonna cost tens of thousands of dollars per dose. There's just no way. It t it's too hard to make it and even if you made a lot of it, I don't think the price is gonna be coming down anytime soon. So, we have our friends who got this uh, hard to make, it, it, what's called a monoclonal antibody drug. And uh, great, they got it because they asked for it. The question now becomes, if you're watching the media and I was getting asked this all day today, so what next? Uh, any of you read the New York Times? Why? <laughs> uh, little survey there. No, if you do read the New York Times, tomorrow, I'll be, you'll see me trying to describe how to distribute more of this drug should we have more of it as a rationing issue. So you're gonna get the lowdown early today. If you had more of this drug, who would you give it to? We gave it to the two people who got it because they asked for it. But now the question becomes, if you had more, what would you do? So my argument is this. You still don't know, despite the fact that these two people are around who got the drug, if it works. Why not? Because if their livers die from an over-immune response next week, I don't think anybody's going to say, well, that was a great drug. You still kill them. Even for terminally ill people looking for, desperately for something, trust me on this, having done a lot of research ethics over the years, we can kill you faster and we can make you sicker. We can make you suffer more. Those of you old enough to remember Barney Clark and the first artificial heart, he took it because he thought it would help him. He died stroking out, bleeding, demented, and screaming for them to shut the device off, the first artificial heart. I mean, we, he had a really miserable way to go that wouldn't have been as bad if he hadn't been on the experimental device. So choices are tougher. People think, I'm gonna die. What difference does it make? It can make a difference. It can be a downside to taking the experimental thing. It can also be a downside to spend $10,000 to try it if it doesn't work. So you can spend your tuition fund, your retirement fund, trying to get this stuff. 
Do insurance companies love to pay for experimental unapproved drugs? <laughs> That's a good laugh. They don't like to pay for proven established drugs. <laughs> we have that problem with the hepatitis C drug, Sovaldi now. Looks like it's working. $80,000 for a run of 12 weeks of the thing. It's that $1,000 pill. Uh, trust me, whoever it is, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, they're not running down the street to say, yeah, let's pay for you to have a shot at your anti-Ebola $50,000 untested monoclonal <laughs> antibody. It's not going to work that way. So there are fiscal obstacles. You're going to pay out of pocket. A company might decide to give you something, as apparently happened here, but I don't know how long that's going to go on. And to be fair to the company, how long could it go on? They'd go broke. They give away the supply of their drug. How are they ever going to get it tested to get it approved? You can't just be altruistic completely for a little nine-person company. And even a big company can't take hits like that for long. So money becomes another factor in deciding who gets something. This drug is really a pain in the neck because aside from the manufacturing process involved, you have to freeze it. It's very sensitive. And they had to ship it in cold storage to Liberia, defrost it, administer it to the people there through an IV, which means clean water. It's not a drug you're going to take into rural Guinea. They don't have refrigerators. They probably don't have clean water. So part of the issue of who's going to get this drug next is going to be who's got refrigeration, who has saline, who has nurses and doctors around. I can tell you that's probably your most likely list of next candidates. But further, let's say I want to figure out if this thing really works. Am I going to take the person who's almost dead and give it to him to try and rescue them? Morally, I might say, give them a shot. They're almost dead. Let's try. But if I do that, am I going to know whether they died because the drug didn't work or because they were so sick that it wouldn't have mattered we gave it too late? And our monkeys, remember them, who got better given the drug, it was given to them only 48 hours after they were infected, not 10 days, which is what happened to the two people who came back to Atlanta. And it's certainly not 20 days, which is when you're really dying. My hunch is, in order to establish whether this thing works, if you had more of it, you would have to ration it to see whether it is efficacious and safe by giving it to people who are newly infected but not nearly dead. If you don't have a baseline that you can say, well, that guy died because the disease killed him, as opposed to that guy died because the drug killed him, then you're never going to get an answer to whether it works. So with new things, who you give it to starts to shape in different directions. Can I freeze it? Can I defrost it? Can I give it in an environment where uh, it's possible to give it by an IV? Am I going to be able to watch the person to see what their side effects are? What happens if I give it to somebody in rural Africa and they wander away? I don't know what happens to them. I have to give it to some of you sick because I want to see if it works, but I don't want to give it to them if they're almost dead because maybe then I can't tell whether it worked. Everybody following that? So you're starting to narrow who it is, and you can start to see why people who are in richer countries probably have a little advantage over people in poorer countries as being nets in line to get this. There's another moral thing to think about, which you can ask me about here. Um, the doctors and nurses, I said, are the most likely to get it because they're most likely to be exposed. I actually think that should count, personally. You go in harm's way, you try to help. I think you're probably a better candidate because you're more at risk to give it to than just anybody else. Not to say everybody else isn't worthwhile, but if you want people to face risk of a deadly infection, you might want to give them a safety net and you might want to encourage more people to participate saying, well, you're going to get more priority in the next batch of the drug. So that is my position. You're probably going to get healthcare workers, uh, people who serve food, people in the hospital setting. They're going to get a little more priority relative to the supply we've got. And the reason is not because they're nicer or better. It's because they're in harm's way more. And that seems to me to be a better explanation of why they might get more priority. But starting from here, you can narrow down the list of people you're going to give it to probably to here. And at that point, you're probably going to then hopefully flip a coin. I'm not sure there's much else 
that's going to distinguish them. Although I could imagine some people saying, if I got from here to here, and there are Americans in there, and the drugs in America, I want Americans first. Now, the rest of the world isn't going to like that. And personally, I've tried to argue over the years that I'm not sure that nationality alone should be a moral factor in who we give drug to, but that'll be a political call. That's straight up politics. There's probably no moral relevance of nationality, but if we said it's here, we want to give it to our people first, that's how it'll go. Keep in mind, though, when you do that, you give it to your own country first. Should there be a flu epidemic again, a significant amount or percentage of the flu manufacturing, vaccine manufacturing capability is not in the US. So if you don't want to send stuff to them, they may not want to send stuff to you. Even if there's a contract. Somebody said to me, well, there's a contract. I was like, yes, yeah, so well, you go tell India in the middle of a pandemic flu epidemic that they have to send their vaccines to us because there's a contract. I don't think they'll be doing that. They'll use them locally if that's the principle we establish. So there are consequences to saying Americans first that go out in other situations where we might be at the mercy of some other country's willingness to share something with us, something to think about as you ration. But let me move uh, in the spirit of these remarks and kind of like Fidel Castro, I have no idea what time it is here. How am I doing on time? Okay, I'm enjoying myself, listening to myself so much. <laughs> I could just stand up here and keep going for a long time. But um, I do want to get to that health reform thing. So I'll end on this note. Despite all the interest in who would get the next medicine and who should we give it to, to tell you the truth, I don't care. Because nobody is going to be making any more of this stuff in the next six months. You need tobacco plants, you need rats, you got to purify it. Uh, I mean, it's not going to happen. What is going to happen is you better double down on your prevention effort to stop the spread of the epidemic. More goggles, more gloves, more travel restriction, more isolation, more don't touch the body education, more don't let the blood splatter. You could bring the epidemic, as we have in the past, to a halt if you push that side of the equation. If you ask me, I wouldn't be spending too much to develop more of this right now. I would be spending most of what I've got to try and shut the epidemic down. It's going to take too long to make this. If you shut the epidemic down, then guess what? You can still test the next batch of this, but it's not under crazy circumstances. You can even test the next batch on healthy human volunteers, see what side effects they produce. So you could do it in a much more organized way if you, we don't get ourselves crazy over the idea that there's a magical cure in a uh, refrigerator full of medicine somewhere. There isn't. It's a nice hypothetical, and I took you through it so you would think about rationing and some of the value issues that come up in the real world, but there isn't a refrigerator or a vat or anything. And to make it and to push resources in that direction right now, I would say, is a mistake. You want to control the epidemic and shut it off. That, I think, could be done in six months to a year. Then we can worry about vaccines and cures. So. I'm sure no one will listen to me. But anyway, that's a, a kind of an argument to go about what we should be doing now. So let me move over to the less happy subject than deadly plagues of health reform. And uh, say uh, this. Some people say, well, we don't have to ration under the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. It's always funny to, how you describe it gives you away politically. Um, but whatever that health reform thing is that you either love or hate, one of the arguments is, well, whatever we do there, we're certainly not going to have to ration health care. We're going to give people more access, and we will find ways to control cost. And to that, I'm going to tell you, forget about it. I'm a supporter of the Affordable Care Act. I think it's the right way to go. But it is an insurance reform. It gives people access to be able to buy insurance that they can then use to gain access to health care, presuming there's somebody there to give them access to health care. So if you're having a baby in West Virginia where most of the counties don't have an obstetrician, you can take out your insurance card from Obamacare and put it in your mouth 
and bite on it. Because <laughs> there's nobody there to give you any care. And rural Colorado would have some of this, and so do rural Missouri and many other. Some urban areas are pretty empty of doctors or nurses. Doesn't solve that problem. In fact, if primary care is not attracting people to practice, and if some primary care people are fed up with being overwhelmed and setting up boutique practices, you know, you pay me a fee and I'll see you, but I'm only gonna see this many people. It's kind of a seat license for you Bronco fans <laughs> to get a seat license to get the right to buy a ticket. <laughs> so that's the boutique medical model. You have to pay me a fee and then you'll pay me again when you see me. But some of that's in primary care now, and that means fewer providers available to others. So where are all the people gonna go, newly enfranchised, who want primary care? They're gonna be rationed. The solution I'm gonna tell you is, and we better be moving on this, to give more authority to nurses, physician assistants, pharmacists, I don't know, veterinarians, anybody. Um, <laughs> ethicists should treat you somebody, and they, you know, they can talk you to death. So um, you need more primary care help right away. I'm pleased that there are more medical schools opening. I'm pleased there's more encouragement of people to go into uh, primary care. That will happen 10 years from now by the time those people are done. So we're still gonna be rationing access despite giving more people access to insurance. We didn't increase the supply of anything that way, particularly the primary care. Health reform says, well, you know, we'll contain costs because what we're gonna do is emphasize prevention. Now this is Colorado, everybody loves to bike, eat well, I mean healthy. I like to eat well, but most people like to eat healthy <laughs> here. And then, uh, you know, they're kayaking and paddling and running around like nuts. <laughs> so this is all great, except you are in the den of iniquity here. What's the main industry of this burg? <laughs> Skiing. They build orthopedic clinics around ski slopes. <laughs> exercise is good, but it's got to be the right kind of exercise. Ever since I looked down Route 40 this week, I've seen every knucklehead on a motorcycle without a helmet. Not cheap. Very expensive to bounce down the road on your head. And who knows what will happen if you smoke 20 blunts a day? I don't know. Um, I guess we'll all find out in some big statewide experiment. So, um, so prevention, here's the real point. It sounds good, but it has two problems. One, it's not clear that it works. Some forms of exercise, not so good. Skiing could cause injuries. Playing football, turns out riding a horse is stupid from a health point of view. <laughs> Fall off, get kicked, stepped on, bad. <laughs> um, so you wanna do things that are healthy, but a lot of the strategy, and, uh, we have calorie counts up in New York City where I am now, you know, you post up the calories. So what that does for me is it makes me feel bad when I eat my donut. <laughs> then I didn't eat it, I just felt bad. Oh, look at that, 4,000 calories, eh, it's bad. So I'm not sure we know what to do that makes people behave or change behavior. We've had a triumph with smoking, clearly not doing much with obesity, other things that we want to encourage, risk reduction, eh, mixed results. Even if you do prevent things, do you really save money? Not really, you push the cost out. If you want to save money, what you do is you encourage people to smoke, drive fast, drink when they're driving, and don't wear those helmets. That will save you a lot of money because you'll die young and quickly. <laughs> what happens if you push prevention is you get this. <laughs> and what that means is not good fiscally. <laughs> you get a lot of older people living longer. They still, I don't want to say this in Colorado, it's very bad to say it, but no matter how far you run, you still get Alzheimer's, you still get Parkinsonism, you still get cancer, might not get it as fast. I'm not saying don't do it, but it doesn't save you money, it just pushes the cost out. 
In fact, here's something to ponder. I know I know I'm pushing my time, but I'm in charge. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the exchange rate for running versus life extension is you probably add about uh, half a minute of life for every minute you spend running. Take that as a rough equation. So, you can live longer, but if you don't like running, you're an idiot. <laughs> All right? I mean, <laughs> it does extend your life, but you have to spend more time doing something you don't like. Good prevention lecture, isn't it? Um, so anyway, we have these trade-offs that we make. We don't know how to really prevent. I don't think we're going to save money there. One other thing that people say about health reform is, oh, well, we'll save money because we'll get rid of the fraud. <laughs> One man's fraud is another person's living. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> do we do anything to reform malpractice? Nope. So I can tell doctors or nurses, do fewer tests, be prudent, be steward of good resources, go to court. Why didn't you do that test? I'm a good steward you're guilty, pay a lot of money. If you don't link evidence-based medicine to malpractice reform, you will not change doctors' behavior. They practice defensively, they practice uh, prudently, but with an eye toward who's gonna yell at me. You have to link up uh, efforts at using evidence to drive coverage to malpractice reform, we haven't done anything about that. And the last one is evidence-based standards. Health reform links right now to the idea that we'll collect a lot of evidence on what works and then we'll pay for that and we'll get rid of the stuff that doesn't work, which seems reasonable, except let me try some interventions with you. Mammography. Do you need a mammogram every year after 50? What does the evidence say? No. The day that uh, evidence came out, it was done by the US Preventative Health Service Committee, which is a very well-respected and good, solid group of people with good evidence saying you get more harm from being exposed to radiation, it doesn't detect enough cancer to make a difference, the cancers it detects are too far along, so you don't save lives, there's a lot of reasons not to do it. The president's wife was asked, what do you think? And she said, well, I wouldn't follow those guidelines. <laughs> Health and Human Services Secretary, then Sebelius said, I think you should talk to your doctor. Talk to your doctor. Your doctor just got the guidelines. What's to say? <laughs> Mammography, change in behavior post 50, the guidelines three years out, about 1% fewer mammograms in that population. Nothing has happened. How can it be bad not to get a test? Well, I want to get a test. It's good. And we told women for a long time it was very responsible to get tested a lot. You don't turn on a dime that way. Proton beam, anybody heard of that particular technology? Good for prostate cancer, treat prostate, really good device, costs about $5 trillion to build one of these things. We have 30 and counting in the US, evidence for the efficacy of proton beam is nothing. But it does let you put up billboards by the side of the road that say, we have a proton beam machine here at Boulder, we don't know what the hell it does, but you can only get it here. which is pretty much the marketing of a lot of technology. It's like, well, <laughs> you wouldn't want to go to Yippa, now the Cleveland Clinic, now there's a place that has a lot of stuff. So we like our technology, we don't get shaped much by evidence. If evidence-based medicine is gonna help us contain costs, to date, it's not a happy story. And I'm gonna spare you other examples or I'll tell you in the Q&A some other ones. There's one other reason we're not gonna have to face rationing. We're gonna have to face rationing because the population is aging and it's gonna demand more services and more care and that's just in the demographic cards and that's just what it is. So, I'm for health reform. I'm glad we're gonna give more people access. But to think that we are not gonna come nose to nose with the reality of rationing is to be a political naive. It, it's never gonna happen. We can't use evidence. We didn't reform malpractice. We don't know if prevention works. We haven't got enough primary care people out there. Key elements are not in place to achieve cost containment and we just expanded access and we've got an aging population. Trust me, that is not a formula for cost containment. So we will have to make some choices. 
what we do and how we do it. You can keep in mind my little story about Ebola and who we picked and how we thought about that. But I think we're going to come to a point, if you ask me to predict in American medicine, I'll tell you, I'll end on this today. What we see in America time and again is when we ration in healthcare, we ration by money. And I think that's what we're going to see. I think we're going to see people get access to experimental drugs that may cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're going to pay for them out of pocket and other people won't get them. Big co-pays. Certain things only available to the rich. Now, if that makes you angry, think of it this way. If it's experimental, at least you get to experiment on the rich. <laughs> And they do get to pay for it, too. So it's, it's not a bad system, maybe. Um, but I think America has shown an unwillingness to set age limits, an unwillingness to say either young or old. It doesn't do well with evidence. It hasn't done particularly well with sin for the reasons I told you. Well, I started to get into. Some people say, why should I pay for people who don't take care of themselves? And that's a good philosophy, except if you went to the hospital and threw out all the people who didn't take care of themselves, there'd only be two Mormon elders and a nun left in there. <laughs> so that ain't going to work. There's too much sin. And it's fun. So I don't think that's going to be it. I think we're going to get a market solution. I think that's how it's going to be. There's going to be more extreme two-class division. It already exists, but it's going to be broader. I don't like to bring you that sad news. But unless politically we decide to go in a different direction, that I suspect is what the answer is going to be. So that ought to give you some material to chew on or amuse your friends at cocktail parties with. Uh, you can always tell them the Ebola stories. That's a big winner. I <laughs> use it a lot myself. Uh, and I'm going to now open the floor up. I guess you've got people running around with some cards. You're going to this is uh, ask some questions of the speaker time. And I'm going to sit over here to make it seem like I care about your answers. <laughs> They're going to send those questions all back. They're going to send them to me. Oh, OK. Well, I, I think you can now appreciate why so many national and international distinguished groups want art to uh, chair their committees. Uh, now, you have an opportunity to join in. Our, uh, our extremely valuable volunteers are passing around cards that are going to eventually make their way up here. And they won't be screened. We'll just weed out the duplicated ones or the ones that are overtly Excuse political. Excuse me, I think you should screen them. Or, <laughs> or the ones that are outright diabolic for some reason. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, just a, a side point, uh, Art, as he prefers to be referred to, mentioned uh, that Colorado is one of the right to try states. When Governor Hickenlooper signed that, we were the first. I tried and could not find out if it's ever been invoked in this state because then you get into the ethical question of, of patient privacy. So I don't know the answer to that. And since Art covered it well, I think we'll just let that one lie. But I wanted to push a little bit on the economics of this. And uh, I don't want to get into should there be more national health care. Um, I just want to point out one thing that I would wager the majority of the audience does not know. There is one disease right now that has total national health insurance. And it's a relatively rare disease. And the reason it has total national health insurance is fundamentally ethics, which is where I'm going with our guest. The fellow that invented hemodialysis actually dialyzed a patient on the floor of Congress. And he was making the point that if we don't have insurance that will cover dialysis for end-stage renal disease, ESRD as this is called, then you really got an ethical problem. He used the term first, so I can't be blamed. Then you really got a death panel situation. If you, because of costs, have got to decide which patient gets dialyzed, you got an ethical problem. So the Congress, in its wisdom, back when they actually passed laws, <laughs> um, passed this End Stage Renal Disease Act. Because after all, 
How expensive could it be? It's a relatively rare thing. It's devastating if you're afflicted that way. But it's relatively rare, and this ought to be done to avoid death panels. So what's happened? The latest data I could get was 2010. The total Medicare bill for 2010 was about 530 billion, which is half a trillion. The total bill for this rare disease that we now have national health insurance for was 33 billion. So this relatively rare disease is a huge proportion, about 15% of the national health care budget. So what does this say, first of all, about the ethics that we have this unique law covering one disease and how the guy got it through Congress and what this means for our future? Well, there's a lot of interesting angles on the story of kidney dialysis and how it got funded. I hope what I'm about to say doesn't get on the tape and seen at the NIH. The guy who actually invented hemodialysis, Willem Kolff, invented it hiding in an attic from the Nazis using aluminum foil and paper clips in, uh, during World War II. So you don't really need an NIH budget. Just got to get the right paper clips of a smart guy, and he made a dialysis machine. Uh, the fact is, well, why does this program cost what it does? It's because the initial pricing on reimbursement was achieved in the following way. People called up people who were giving kidney dialysis, and they said, what do you think we should pay you? And that's the truth. They said a lot, and uh, the bill started to climb. Then we decided to have a market solution. We introduced for-profit kidney dialysis into the United States and managed to achieve costs four times what anybody else in the world is paying for kidney dialysis. So that's part of the story, and there are some lessons there, but probably the biggest lesson is the reason you don't have national health insurance here is the end-stage renal disease program, because it burned Congress so badly that they never went back to it because it cost so much. But they set it up in such a way, I think, I've always felt, that it was doomed. It had no cost containment in it. You granted access. You set prices according to what the market could drive. And let me add, that's what's still going on in health reform. There's no shift from that. We granted access. Do we do anything about price? I don't think so. So it's not that we've moved so far away from what took place back in 1972 when the dialysis program was funded in, as part of Medicare. I don't think we've learned lessons. The, you mentioned the, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, role in Ebola. Uh, they also do some interesting studies, one of which showed that 88% of Americans get healthcare knowledge from television. Now, whether that frightens you or not, it appears to be a fact. About oh, 20, I, I think it's pretty <laughs> apparent that that's true, yes. About 20 years ago, our guest was quoted in a news magazine, that was how people got news in those days, <laughs> Uh, ripping into a medical reality show as being awful, particularly in its ethical sphere. And I could read you the quote if you want to deny watching such trash. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, it was called Trauma Center. At the time, there was virtually nothing on television that would be a reality show. There were doctor shows, there always have been. But now, there are huge numbers of reality-based shows on television. How do you think, or do they even try to teach Americans anything about the ethical sphere of medical care? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I think they do. They try to teach a little bit about things like what happens inside the hospital. They illustrate some of the things like using a living will or thinking about Managing your dying, you occasionally get a discussion of assisted suicide. Uh, many of you may be thinking about that now, listening to me. And um, you find yourself uh, confronted with some of the tough dilemmas. But there's some interesting features about medical TV shows still that are deceptive. Number one, they always take place in emergency rooms. It's the only place in America where no one pays. So money doesn't loom very large on TV. 
you don't hear about it much because in the ER, despite the fact that they do liver transplants there, deliver babies there, treat your psoriasis there until, I mean, everything's happening in the ER, which isn't true, but it, that's where the drama gets set, you don't get into cost. So that's a problem. Secondly, it is pretty clear that everybody who works in a hospital is a dude or a babe. <laughs> Third, another challenge is that most patients who come into hospitals, they're occasionally your chronic alcoholic, they're occasionally your chronic illness cases, but most of them are emergencies because that's where the drama is. Most of healthcare is about chronic illness. Most of expenditure is about chronic illness. It doesn't overlap. It's, it's great to argue about you know, who should get the dose of medicine for Ebola, but that's not the reality of healthcare. The other thing is things work a lot better on TV. I've said this many times to lots of audiences, but the best place if you need to be resuscitated with CPR to go in the world is television. <laughs> It works like 90% of the time. <laughs> the data that I see says about 8% of witnessed heart attacks and arrests, meaning somebody saw it happen and jumped in, about 8% of the time it works, and a large number of those people still die. That is, they get function back, but they only live another couple hours or another couple days. So TV can make you think that there's a lot more curing going on than in reality there is. So, by the way, let me add one other thing. You're dating us because people don't get their medical information there anymore. They get it on the internet. <laughs> and so now I know when people go to the doctor, they often look up something and it says, Dr. Oz said if you eat green berries and uh, a bit of uh, dust mite and some uh, dust bunnies, this will help your asthma. I mean, really? <laughs> So we have a lot of problems with people just wandering around. If I get one more autism question about vaccines, it'll be one more too many. It's all over the internet, won't die, not true, false, false, better to get vaccinated by far. All over the internet it says you're gonna get autistic, you're gonna get, it's bad for you. So that's another powerful force of information that circulates rumor and innuendo and misperceptions pretty fast. We'll move into, now we have an appreciable number of questions from you folks, and we thank you. Um, Art, you're going to find out there are a number of very bright people in this community, some of whom are so annoying they should be appointed to committees. But uh, let me just see how you can deal with some of these things. There's a whole bunch, I'm going to take the liberty of lumping them, of questions dealing with the enormous cost of the last six months of medical care, uh, supposedly the large proportion of the Medicare budget, mm -hmm. uh, ways to control medical care, such as offshore health care, and of course the ultimate control of end of life medical care costs, assisted suicide. You can go any way you want in that set. Well, the three don't form a continuum, that is if you get involved with assisted suicide, you're probably not going offshore. <laughs> Even I can figure that out. All right, so uh, last six months of life. There is a lot of expenditure in the last six months of life. That is true. It probably accounts for about 50% of the Medicare budget. It, it's not the total budget. That's off of the number that's used, but it's a significant chunk of Medicare money. One problem with it is you only know that somebody's in the last six months of life retrospectively. <laughs> so that makes it a little hard to apply the information. On the other hand, I've got a uh, former oncologist near me, and there are other doctors in the audience. There are clearly instances in which people are not going to recover where we spend too much money giving people things they don't want. I wouldn't deny it. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to not let that happen. A few things you can do, and you should do. How many of you have a living will? How many of you showed it to your family? How many of you showed it to your lawyer? <laughs> Forget that. Um, <laughs> one thing I know about American healthcare is the last person they call up when you're really sick is the lawyer, so I don't know that that's useful. But the most important thing you can do 
is have a conversation about that living will. Not sign it, but talk about it. I used to say, you know, Thanksgiving is a good time to have this conversation. <laughs> Why? Because the people that actually are going to probably show up if you get sick are probably there. I can't help you with that, but that's who it is. And then usually the Detroit Lions are dead by half, so <laughs> you can have time to talk about whatever you like. But what I'm trying to get at more seriously is you want to take advantage of family gatherings, opportunities to talk about it. You really have to talk about it. You should put your, push your church or religious organization to spend a day talking about it. The conversation is the key, not the document. A few other tips. How many of you spend some of the year in Colorado and some of the year elsewhere? Do you have living wills in both states? Because the laws are different. So you may want to do two. It's and a, a, I know I'm giving a longer answer here, but this is the practical part of our day. Um, should you get divorced, it might be a good idea to update that living will. <laughs> I'm laughing because my wife Meg is here. She knows one of my favorite cases involved a guy who was seriously ill. And uh, a woman came in and had the living will. And we were kind of going to back off. And then she was divorced. <laughs> it was like, oh, no, I don't know. You know, maybe not. We should maybe wait a little longer here and not honor that one. You should update it probably every four or five years. Most doctors, if they found a living will, which I'm going to get to in a minute, are not going to be convinced that if you filled it out 15 years ago that that's still binding. So you do need to update the thing if you have it. The most important thing you could do, though, is tell somebody you want them to be your decision maker. Because most living wills aren't that useful. The problem is you have them, they say things like, I don't want to suffer. Oh, I'm on board that. <laughs> but nobody goes to the hospital and doesn't suffer, right? I mean, it's a suffering engine. That's what they do. So they stick you and stab you and torture you and poison you if you're an oncologist. And so suffering is not the standard that you want to rule out. What you mean is, I don't want to suffer for no purpose. <laughs> I would like to get better. If it's just suffering, I don't want to do it. If I'm just going to remain unconscious or impaired, I don't like that. The instructions that living wills give are not specific enough. Doctors usually are a bit flummoxed by them. They can't figure out what you want. So it's much better if you want to do one simple thing to pick a decision maker. It's also useful to tell the decision maker that you picked them. <laughs> Had a few of them back up in my world. I don't know how to do that. I, uh, so you want to make sure they know. But that's the single most important step I think you can take. Other things we could do, I don't, th I don't think physician-assisted suicide is the answer to our cost problems. It may be the answer to controlling how you live and where you die. There's certainly an experiment that has gone on in Washington and Oregon now that I think shows that it can be implemented without abuse. Vermont just adopted it too. Montana has a court order allowing it. Not much data from those places, but Washington and uh, Oregon do have legalization. It's been in place for a long time. People aren't being rushed off to death. But the number of people who, well, this will interest you. The number of people who ask for a pill to end their lives is maybe 10% of the term legal in the state. The number of people who take the pill, probably far less than 1%. People want to know they can escape, but they don't really kill themselves with any uh, high percentage. So it's, it's like having a parachute. You could use it, but once you know it's there, most people don't use it. So it's, I mean, even if you thought of that as somehow related to cost, I don't think that's the reason to institute it. I favor some forms of assisted suicide legalization, but it's got nothing to do with cost or cost savings. So there are things you could do to make things cheaper. The only other thing we could do is, I think to get a handle on end of life care expenditure is, we have to stop promoting false hope. So there is a lot of hope talk around serious illness, even in situations where people know that you're not going to likely get better. And I think the way to handle that is, and this is a medical problem, it's not a patient problem, but you've got to try teaching the doctors and the nurses, rather than offering big hope, 
somebody could always get better. You try to offer little hope, like maybe they could make it to next week. Maybe they could watch the Bronco game tonight, though why that would be of interest to anybody, I don't know. <laughs> or actually, talking about futility, <laughs> I'm, I'm an Eagles fan, so <laughs> what do I know? But uh, there are things that we could do, I think, on the medicine side to, to get people to be more honest and direct. Uh, you know, people don't really want to give up. They want to do the right thing by their family member. They want to chase hope. So you've got to be pretty straightforward. And I don't think we do that well. I don't think we do that well. Um, this is a question I'll read the first part and then make an uh, appendage to. I understand the United Kingdom National Health Service has a board that approves procedures that the National Health Service will pay for. And I believe the state of Oregon also has kind of a cost-benefit list of diagnoses and procedures. And the questioner asks, is this a practical effort to ration health care on a cost-effective basis? Well, Oregon ha uh, had a program where they tried to lay out criteria for access. However, it was only in the Medicaid program. Nobody attempted to ration anything for privately insured people or rich people. And that's an example of what I said. It's a market response to access. The poor will get less, and we'll make a list. I actually tried to oppose that, and I got into it a little bit with Governor Kitzhaber, who I admire because he at least took on the problem. But if you're going to ration, it would seem to me you'd want to do it equitably and say, these are the things you can get no matter how you're paying. That isn't what they did. They rationed in Medicaid. Is it still being implemented? No, because there was so much log rolling among the medical specialties that they undercut the whole effort. So making a list of what you're going to pay for turns out to be tough. And by the way, the experiment in England, which is, goes by the acronym NICE, which ought to make Sarah Palin laugh a lot. <laughs> Not a death penalty. We're nice. Um, nice gets undercut all the time by British politicians. Every time they try and say, we're not paying for this drug, and we're not paying for this, a politician stands up in Parliament and says, well, we have to pay for this. And we, I don't care what the data says. It's a little bit like the mammography thing I was telling you about. So we're not very good at procedure-driven prioritization. It just doesn't, I mean, I'm not against it, and it's one way to go. And if we applied it sort of more fairly to everybody, that might make some sense. But uh, it hasn't had a great history so far of being one way to contain cost. Two more here. One must be important because I have a veritable packet of questions that involve the role of insurance companies uh, in whatever health care insurance programs this country proceeds with. Obviously, they got a lot, millions of new clients with the most recent change. Are, are they going to make all the money? Are they going to be driving whatever rationale or rationing happens? What's your take on the insurance company part of all this, ethically? Yes. <laughs> right. So we, we didn't get opposition to uh, health reform because health reform sold out to the current private insurance model. Now, that is not a huge driver of all American health care still, despite what Congress thinks every time someone wants to stand up and say, I want to do with government want to do away with government health care. I hate government health care. I'm just waiting for them to close the VA, shut down the Department of Defense health system, close Medicare, kill Medicaid, and get rid of the Indian Health Service, because they're all government health. And I might add, last time I looked, the VA system was bigger than the British National Health Service. So we have a lot of government payers, so that private insurance is a smaller segment than you might think. Still, it's expensive. And I think we need to sort of regulate what happens there more tightly. That hasn't been done yet. So health insurers, the guys who try to do it well and responsibly, I think you know they put their panels together. They try to follow the evidence and so on and uh, distribute care accordingly. And I'm a fan of some forms of health insurance covers like Kaiser. I think they try hard to be evidence-based. and. Uh, promote good coverage. But in the end of the day, it's not a particularly efficient, cost-effective way to deliver health care. It has a big overhead. It's very expensive. Uh, other countries don't do it, and it's part of the reason they're cheaper than us. 
Okay, final question. It may seem obvious to some, but you alluded to the relative age of the audience and nobody walked out, so I'll, I'll make a... Well, they were incapable of walking out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm watching. Hey, I'm your age. I can make that joke. I'm watching. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is that probably a, a fair number of, of the audience have had surgical procedures. And I would judge that, like most people going in for surgery, the only main thought they have is, I want this lump out. I want this infected, full of stones, gallbladder gone. I, I just want it out of here. And they don't think much beyond that. And I noted, uh, Chairman, uh, again, that you chaired the committee for the National Cancer Institute's Bio-Tissue Bank, which I presume stores tissue to make it available to sciences, science and experiments and such like that. Who should own a surgical specimen? I assume that's what populates this biology mm -hmm. bank. Who should own it? What are the rights that the owner, or in some cases the former owner, uh, have? And what's the right of the research community and the ethical obligation? Well, next year when I come back, I will uh, <laughs> answer that. Uh, that's a long, that's a tough one because it's got a lot of ins and outs. I'll give you the, sh I don't know, the shortest summary I can think of. We've had, uh, basically the conversion of medical waste into medical value. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, if someone took out your tumor, you didn't want it, right? They weren't gonna give it to you in a, well, I guess in a bag, he's in a peanut butter jar and say, you know, do you wanna take this? Well, I guess they did a little bit. Some people got things to take home, or occasional kidney stones that went home or something. But generally, you weren't gonna do anything with it. You might have put it on the shelf or something, but, um, so now all of a sudden people say, ooh, I want to know the, what the genotype is of those tumors. I'm going to target medicine toward those tumors. It's very important to understand the genetics and biology of tumors and other parts that come out of people. Why are some people sicker, quicker than others? It's clearly biological. I want to study tissue samples so that I can come to understand some of the genetic differences that drive responses to drugs. You know, most drugs that we have they don't work in a fair number of people that we give them to, or they have bad side effects. Coumadin, warfarin, some of you may be on that. Some people metabolize it fast. Some people don't do much with it at all. This is genetic. And so we all of a sudden, instead of incinerating things that came out of the body, we now want to study them. And that's what biobanking is all about. So the real core of the question is, so who should control these things? And what we did with the... Uh, biobanking committees, we said we should get people's permission. We should ask you, can we use these tissues or uh, biological samples uh, for research? The fight is not so much about asking. I think most people agree you should be asked. If for some reason you don't want to give your you know, uh, tumor to science, you want to take it home, um, OK. Um, but it's, do we have to ask you every time somebody wants to study something about that tumor? I favor broad consent. I give you the tissue, use it for science, goodbye. Others would say, I have to ask you every time if I can do a study on your breast cancer tumor or prostate tumor, because I may then decide I'm gonna study something else about your biological sample. One day I'm looking at the biology of cancer, but your tissue might also be used to tell me whether you were prone to diabetes, or maybe even to schizophrenia. And do I have to ask your permission every time I want to do it? My answer is no. It makes it too expensive. It makes it too complicated. I've got to find you five years later and say, hey, you remember? We sought out your liver. Uh, now, what do you think? Can we use it to study something? So I, I think the right answer is to give consent, but give broad consent, not case-by-case, case, study-by-study study consent. And we don't have agreement yet in this country on what that should look like. So if we're going to move faster with this new genetic knowledge, I think we'd better settle that issue, and I would rather settle it toward open-ended consent. So I don't think we shouldn't just take it 
you have a right to say what you want done with it, but uh, I suspect you know, it ought to be more like organ donation. When we ask you to be an organ donor, we don't say, would you like to donate your organ and give it to art? <laughs> I've argued for that policy for many years. <laughs> you give it gen gen generally, right? You don't say, I want to give it, but only if it goes to a Lutheran who's left-handed and lives in Greeley and... Uh, so I think that's the model we need for the biobanks. Well, Art, you'd certainly be on the top of my list of people we'd like to invite back. Oh. We thank you so very much.